So it's a real pleasure to be introducing, uh, th again, once again, this week's Bar Shop Seminar Series. I think we're low on people. I know that there must be a bunch of people at the uh, large neurosciences meeting. I suspect that's where most people are. Um, but anyway, uh, today our speaker is Dr. Uh, Bala Kuntalam uh, Karsanath, uh, who is a uh, professor in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Nephrology here at Utuska. Uh, I think everyone uh, 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 calls Dr. Kasanath uh, Kashi, and so I'll yep. take that liberty. Yeah, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kashi is uh, a staff physician uh, at the VA uh, and also an attending physician at the University uh, Hospital here in San Antonio. He is a fellow of the... Uh, um, Society uh, for Nephrologists, and uh, in fact, that's an honour bestowed, bestowed upon uh, members who are distinguished for their uh, uh, excellence, either in research or the clinic. Uh, uh, Kashi received his MBBS uh, in India, and then his training uh, in various institutes in Chicago. He joined the faculty in 1990, and has been here ever since. He's Efforts as a f uh, physician are recognised uh, nationally. He, for the last 14 years, he's ranked as uh, the top 1% of physicians here in, here in the US. Uh, now, as a research scientist, he's published uh, well over 100 papers, uh, active in many uh, review boards. Uh, and the focus of his work today, uh, of his talk today, is going to be on his uh, research, and that is investigating the role of the extracellular matrix <coughs> in both the ageing uh, of kidney uh, and the dysfunction, the pathological changes that occur in the diabetic uh, nephrology. Okay, and on that note, thanks. Thank you. Very kind of you. Oh, perfect. All right, so I'm going to stand here so I can actually see what I'm projecting. Uh, so um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge people who have very importantly contributed to this work. I'm just the spokesperson for this group. Uh, Huck Chu Lee, uh, who is in the audience, uh, will, his, his work is, is most of the work that we present today of, led, of more recent uh, vintages from his uh, efforts. And these two have left the institution and they have also very importantly contributed to this work. And our summer students are listed here. And these are my um, collaborators within the um, UTHSVSA, including Nick Moosey. And Hannah, as you know, passed away in January unexpectedly. And uh, he was collaborate, he collaborated with me on a couple of these projects. Chris Cavill measures uh, sulfide concentrations. By the way, this, uh, this talk was already in place before Solomon Snyder came. So uh, I'm sure most of you enjoyed his talk. And we are also uh, making our entrance into that field of hydrogen sulfide. And Barshop Institute uh, collaborators are listed here without whose kind help there would be no way to present this data that we will be seeing today. Uh, and funding support is indicated. Uh, but now I'm down to just VA research service. So the objectives of the talk today are twofold. Kidney injury and diabetes in aging mice and or mechanisms and interventions that are effective in early stage relevant as the mice get older. Um, and secondly, what are the mechanisms of renal aging, our signaling events, and uh, uh, what are the signaling events? And we, our focus in, an, in, in my lab is on signaling regulation so that we can identify novel targets for intervention. So let's start with the first uh, 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 segment of the talk. So as you know, diabetes is, is literally and figuratively exploding in the United States. And this is related to um, the progressive increment in the prevalence of obesity, insulin resistance, and, uh, and, and hand in hand, you can see the increment in prevalence of obesity and diabetes in the United States. Um, so diabetic kidney disease uh, fortunately doesn't it doesn't occur in majority of patients with diabetes. It's a deadly disease. Um, patients with diabetic nephropathy, as it's called, diabetic kidney disease, 
don't live as long as other diabetics do. It's one of the kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, and diabetic kidney disease is especially a malignant risk factor for cardiovascular mortality uh, and premature death. So one-third of them develop diabetic kidney disease, and it is the number one cause of end-stage kidney disease requiring dialysis and kidney transplantation in the United States and the rest of the world also. Well, there is some kind of a, a good news of late. Uh, there is a reduction in the incidence of diabetic end-stage kidney disease over the last few years. This is perhaps due to efforts at better control of blood sugar, better control of blood pressure, detection of diabetes in larger and larger numbers of people in the society. However, this may be the calm before the storm because diabetes tsunami is perhaps in the offing. In 2011 to 12, enhanced data indicate that pre-diabetes is fully seen in one-third of American population. Now, the diabetes prevalence is 12.3 nationally, but is overrepresented in minority populations. Diabetes in 2050, there is a prediction from the CDC that a child born in year 2000 has a one in three risk of becoming diabetic over the lifespan. So if that were to be so, and one third of diabetic patients develop end-stage kidney disease, we are likely to see in the coming decades that 10% of American population may well have diabetic kidney disease, and I just mentioned what the malignant nature of diabetic kidney disease is. So we are really sitting on a potential time bomb, and, and it is really, there is no economic development that I can foresee that will even begin to address this problem. Uh, End-stage kidney disease care in 2011 was $50 billion. This is just the end-stage kidney disease patients, not patients with chronic kidney disease that don't require dialysis or transplantation. And, and, and actually, if you see the lifespan and the prevalence, the prevalence is in millions until a certain stage of kidney disease, and then it drops off. So by the time, only a minority live long enough to reach end-stage kidney disease in diabetes. Most of them dying prematurely due to coronary artery disease. So even in those minority, we are talking 25 to $30 billion being spent on diabetic end-stage kidney disease. And this cost expected, I mean, estimated in 2012 is $250 billion just to take care of diabetes and its complications. And if this is at a prevalence of 12%, you can imagine what it will be if the prevalence rises to one-third of American population. So it's a pretty serious uh, disease. So the features are, in fact, the kidney first grows in diabetes and becomes hypertrophic. The cell size increases. It's not due to cell number increment. And the filtration function, uh, clearance function, also actually increases. There is super-functioning or hyper-functioning kidney in the beginning, which then begins to decline over time with the appearance of uh, protein in the urine that keeps on uh, increasing. I guess I have to do something here. So proteinuria increases and the clearance function drops and then eventually reaches end-stage kidney disease. Hypertension appears and the, um, the hallmark of changes in the kidney in diabetes is increase in extracellular matrix proteins which close off these open capillary loops which permit for anywhere from 150 to 200 liters of plasma to be filtered on a daily basis so that we can eliminate waste products. And as the capillary lobes close, there is less and less surface area available for waste disposal, therefore kidney uh, failure. And it correlates with microvascular injury elsewhere, such as diabetic retinopathy. So our interest in diabetes has been, uh, we've been in this business for a few a couple of decades now, and in around the, about 10, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, we reported that mTOR complex 1 was activated in the cortex of mice with type 2 diabetes. There was evidence for AKT phosphorylation on serine 473 correlating with mTOR complex 2 activation, and then mTOR itself, 2448 phosphorylation has increased. This is a P70A6 kinase site, and phosphorylation of P70A6 kinase is on threonine 1389 and 4 bp one was also increased. These are direct 
phosphorylation sites for mTOR. So, there was overall evidence for AKT, PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway to be activated correlating with the protein synthesis that is required for increased um, uh, cell growth such as hypertrophy as well as matrix accumulation that occurs at this time. So, the question is how rapidly this was, these mice were diabetic for about two to three months. And um, we asked, well, if in cell culture we can see actually that high glucose and high insulin, which are the uh, factors that are pathogenic in type 2 diabetes due to insulin resistance, can initiate laminin, which is a matrix protein that accumulates in and results in scarring of the kidney, can occur within two to five minutes. This we reported in 2007, which was tremendously fast and we could work out in our details that this was due to accelerated mTOR complex 1 activation, mRNA translation, there was no change in messenger RNA. So, the efficiency of translation uh, ribosomal function was increased and therefore more matrix protein. We have albuminuria, hmm? albumin in the urine, Already lots of protein, okay. protein in the urine. All right. So, then we asked how rapidly does kidney actually respond to milieu that simulates type 2 diabetes. This was done, uh, we, uh, this came out last year. This was done in collaboration with Dr. Moussi and Dr. DiFronzo, uh, who are mavens in CLAMP studies. These are normal rats that had high glucose and high insulin only for 7 hours. That is it. So, that resulted in increase in laminin, the increase which is a matrix protein, TGF beta protein was increased, SMAD3 phosphorylation was increased indicating the TGF beta pro-fibrogenic signaling pathway was already activated and then mTOR complex 1 was activated as shown by P70A6 kinase phosphorylation. There was increase in ERK as well as a two-step downstream target of ERK, which is EAF4E, which is a rate-limiting protein for mRNA translation, one of the most important drivers of initiation phase of mRNA translation. Yes, Randy. So, how long was the short duration? Seven hours. Seven hours. That's it. So, seven hours also resulted in, of course, phosphorylation of AKT, which is on the P, uh, serine 473 site. So, what this showed to us was that even a short duration was enough to set in motion ERK and its downstream targets of mRNA translation initiation phase and P76 mTOR complex 1 and mTOR complex 2 were all activated within 7 hours of modest hyperglycemia. This was not like 8900 uh, hyperglycemia, 340 was the sugar. would happen during a meal? Yeah. Actually, in diabetics, yes, it can go up to this much, this kind of a height of uh, plasma glucose. This is why um, uh, drugs that, uh, like spike. It might help, yes, yes. And what was additional surprise was this. Within seven hours, we saw significant monocyte infiltration in the kidney. Diabetes is also an immunological disease. We have monocyte infiltration in the kidney in the beginning, in the interim, as well as towards the, uh, you know, uh, towards the end stage of kidney disease. And this was associated with activation of NF-kappa B. And we connected this asking the question, is this due to TLR4 activation? TLR4 activation was assessed as co-immunoprecipitation of TLR4 with mid-88, which is a a, a docking protein that kind of binds to the cytoplasmic domain of TLR4 resulting downstream in NF-kappa B activation. So, it looks like that duration of 7 hours of high glucose and high insulin stimulate TLR4 activation result in NF-kappa B activation which then uh, increases these chemokines that attract uh, su such as for example MCP1 uh, that attract monocytes to infiltrate in the kidney. Yeah. Have you been able to establish the role of glucose versus insulin in this? You know, we applied grants in five different places 
we thought this was important. We could not get funded in any one of those places, including American Diabetes Association, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, American Heart Association. So Malini, who did all this work, uh, was an assistant professor when she did this work. She just could not get funded. So this, was, this coincided, of course, with our, uh, um, you know, the economic problem, the Wall Street crash, and so on. So basically, acute rise in blood glucose, I'm sorry. I think that if you use the insulin receptor knockout mice, I we propose that. that. In fact, oh, we have okay. we right. have generated uh -huh. proximal tubule specific insulin receptor right. mice, knockout mice. It it made it to you know what we hear is like yeah oh this is great but uh -huh. didn't meet the funding. Oh, so so acute rise in blood glucose and insulin promotes kidney injury. Rapid onset of signaling reactions um, of uh, driving protein synthesis is seen within a short duration. TLR for stimulation and NF-kappa B activation and monocyte infiltration result in uh, uh, inflammatory uh, damage. So this you could see, uh, Randy, you're asking, so in diabetic subjects postprandially or in obese or insulin resistant subjects where you may not reach 340, but you might reach 200, 250, uh, such kind of blood sugars. And plasma insulin will go up there in the pre-diabetic stage because the beta cells are not yet completely destroyed. So postprandial rises in blood glucose have been linked to cardiovascular disease as an independent risk factor, even though there's a lot of debate in literature about this. So uh, here is the, uh, we, I didn't present all the data. This is basically what our pathway was, where short-term high glucose, high insulin results in activation of pro-fibrogenic TGF-beta, driving ERK, uh, AKT mTOR complex pathway, reactions in initiation and elongation phase mRNA translation, which are the rate limiting steps for any protein synthesis, including renal matrix protein synthesis and inflammation onset as well. So uh, is mTOR a target for M intervention? So this I'll be very brief. This we published quite some time ago in 2007. We took DBDB mice and gave rapamycin by intraperitoneal injection. And uh, for only a short duration, for two weeks, this is early stage of diabetes. They are only diabetic for about uh, four weeks or so. So blood sugar was elevated. RAPA did not change the blood sugar. RAPA inhibited the hypertrophy of the kidney. RAPA reduced accumulation of laminin matrix protein in the glomeruli uh, compared to vehicle treated. And wrap, uh, by uh, immunoblotting of renal cortex also, we could show reduction in laminin in, uh, uh, rap, uh, in diabetic mice. And the evidence that RAPA actually worked uh, was that the P76 kinase uh, phosphorylation was reduced in rapa treated mice. So this led us to hypothesize that type 2 diabetes, high glucose, and stimulates P83 kinase AKT mTOR pathway and promotes mRNA translation and therefore <coughs> kidney growth, protein synthesis required for kidney growth such as hypertrophy and uh, laminin accumulation. So, and this was uh, uh, also confirmed by a number of other studies. So then the question is, uh, and, and there are studies to show al albuminuria, the matrix uh, component and al albuminuria was also decreased by rapamycin in early stages. What are the endogenous regulators of mTOR? Can we identify natural mTOR inhibitors and strengthen them in order to put a lid on exaggerated mTOR activation that results in tissue injury? The reason we were looking for this is we I'm not presenting the data. We have identified AMP activated protein kinase as a very important inhibitor, constitutive inhibitor of mTOR in kidney. And uh, actually, Nick was involved in this study as well with us. We showed that. AMPK activation is reduced in diabetic kidney when we gave metformin and ICAR, which stimulate um, um, AMPK, we could inhibit diabetes-induced hypertrophy. We published that also around the same time. But we were looking for other natural uh, regulators of mTOR. So we came across and around this time that in literature that hydrogen sulfide reduces cardiac hypertrophy, suggesting it inhibits protein synthesis. 
So there was this literature in the cardiology uh, world, but there was no further uh, insight into how would hydrogen sulfide affect protein synthesis in the cells. Circulating hydrogen sulfide is lower in diabetic patients and in rodent models. Hypertrophy and accumulation of matrix occur in the kidney in diabetes. So our hypothesis was hydrogen sulfide modulates high glucose induced protein synthesis in kidney cells. So we started with a simple in vitro uh, kind of uh, examination. So let's talk about hydrogen sulfide. It's one of the primordial gases even in organic and uh, inorganic evolution of Earth. In fact, um, there was a paper that came out in Nature Chemistry this year saying that the earliest life forms may have evolved because of, uh, with the participation of hydrogen sulfide. And it is endogenously produced, it's, it's well conserved from prokaryotes all the way up to human beings all across the evolutionary spectrum. It is made by three enzymes, cystathionine gamma lyase, cystathionine beta synthase, three mercaptosulfur transferase. And here is a sort of a schematic showing that L-homocysteine uh, is converted to cystathionine to the, then to L-cysteine, which then uh, becomes the source for hydrogen sulfide. So um, it is in, we knew from uh, um, studies in late 20th century that hydrogen sulfide is made by many, many tissues, including the kidney. But the reputation of hydrogen sulfide was that of a sewer gas, which was intolerable and therefore must be so toxic, and there are toxic, uh, you know, well-documented toxicities, some uh, uh, species being uh, wiped out from the planet Earth during evolution has been attributed to excessive hydrogen sulfide in the environment, like in the Permian era and so on. So, but so that was the maturity of the hydrogen sulfide. So there was always a question, what does it do? It's a terrible gas, so we might as well not study it. A paper came out in 1996 that, in fact, hydrogen sulfide is made in the brain and may have a role in memory. The seminal paper that really raised the interest in hydrogen sulfide as a physiologically important molecule was in 2008 in science where CSC knockout mice, this enzyme which is critical for generation of hydrogen sulfide, actually developed hypertension. And this hypertension, as you could see, was graded according to the dose deficiency of the gene, could be eminently treated by providing sodium hydrosulfide, which releases hydrogen sulfide immediately. So there was a reduction in blood pressure. Even in this could be, they, by through experimental maneuvers, they eliminated any role for ENOS in this. So this was all hydrogen sulfide-driven vasoactivity. So does hydrogen sulfide regulate protein synthesis? So then came a number of papers that studied hydrogen sulfide on vasodilatation, oxidative stress, but there was no information whether hydrogen sulfide affects protein synthesis. So um, Hakju, who is in the audience, started looking at this using high glucose, which clearly stimulates protein synthesis and causes hypertrophy. And he provided sodium hydrosulfide and the high glucose induced high protein synthesis as well as cell hypertrophy defined as protein content per unit number of cells and laminin accumulation and collagen 4, which is, these are two matrix proteins that the podocytes make. These are glomerular epithelial cells, was all inhibited by sodium hydrosulfide. So then the question is, since the de novo general protein synthesis and specific protein synthesis is, increased, is decreased, uh, that's induced by high glucose, what's the mechanism? So we know that protein synthesis is rate limited by mRNA translation. So he looked at P70A6 kinase, which is critical for both the initiation and elongation phases of mRNA translation. High glucose induced the phosphorylation of P70A6 kinase through mTOR activation. This is direct evidence for mTOR activation, was shot down by sodium hydrosulfide. So since we had reported AMPK is a natural upstream inhibitor of mTOR complex 1. So we asked, is hydrogen sulfide affecting AMPK? Sure enough, hydrogen sulfide rapidly increased AMPK phosphorylation. And it corrected the reduction in AMPK phosphorylation that occurs in high glucose and restored it to normal. So then we asked, is the hydrogen sulfide inhibition of mTOR complex 1 AMPK dependent by applying compound C, which is a selective inhibitor of AMPK? So high glucose stimulated 
mTOR complex 1, sodium hydrosulfide inhibited it and that inhibition was lost in the presence of compound C indicating AMPK activation is required for hydrogen sulfide to inhibit high glucose induced mTOR complex 1. And of course, we could see, see the importance of AMPK as a mediator of uh, sodium hydrosulfide inhibition of matrix synthesis as well with compound C. So next we asked, is hydrogen sulfide regulated in animal models? Those were cell cultures, so what about animal models? We took two types of spontaneous uh, type, two, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. These mice, OVE26 mice developed spontaneous type 1 diabetes. DBDB mice developed spontaneous type 2. And both the CBS and CSC expression was significantly decreased in these mice at the time the kidney showed hypertrophy and matrix accumulation occurred and albuminuria occurred. So here is a immunoperoxidase done by uh, one of our colleagues, Rita. She did a good job showing, showing that CBS expression is clearly reduced in the tubules in cortex of type 1 diabetic mice. And Hugju became famous because of uh, this JBC awarded it paper of the week uh, for this uh, work. Now, is there evidence that if you give back sodium hydrosulfide to diabetic mice, is there going to be amelioration of diabetic kidney injury? We have not published this. Hugju gave sodium hydrosulfide in water. Believe me, it is a stinking thing to have hydrogen sulfide in the lab. And he has to wear eye protection, nose protection, all protection, but the mice love it. So they really lap it up. So we put it in drinking water. And uh, we can, for, for example, confirm other data that actually this is a very specific assay for hydrogen sulfide, free sulfide content. This is done by HPLC of a, a, a product that comes from treatment with monobromobimane. It is done in LSU. And blood content and kidney content of hydrogen sulfide is decreased in diabetic mice. And when given three weeks of um, sodium hydrosulfide in drinking water, uh, 30 micromoles per liter. There is not significant change in the uh, elevated blood glucose of diabetic mice. Albuminuria became less, and AMPK activity didn't reach quite significance, but the vehicle treated had low AMPK rest and uh, restored to normal by uh, sodium hydrosulfide. And importantly, matrix protein laminin, uh, as well as oxidative stress marker NOx4 could be completely restored by hydrogen sulfide. This is now type 2 diabetes. So they, oh, I, we haven't measured the plasma insulin. No, we have not measured the plasma insulin. We probably won't be affected because the blood glucose isn't any different. Um, could, uh, the question about the absorption of, side, of sodium hydro, hydrogen sulfide, is it, is it well absorbed by the GI tract? Yes, yes. The, uh, it is well absorbed, but we did not measure the uh, blood sodium, uh, like sulfide content after sodium hydrosulfide. But is, is, it, would it, is this a physiological or normal um, material that would be normally found in foodstuffs and would, would, uh, would be physiologically absorbed? Or is this no. going to cross so, react with so some we, other absorption mechanism? We depend on cysteine, for example, content of diet in order to generate hydrogen sulfide. So we do not take in hydrogen sulfide through food. What we do is, of course, the cysteine, and then that potentiates the pathways, that, as, as I showed you, uh, through the actions of CBS and CSC to generate hydrogen sulfide in situ. Hydrogen sulfide has an extremely short half-life. It's a few seconds. So it's all intracellularly generated, but the mapping shows that these enzymes are there in practically every tissue that has been examined so far. Almost every cell has hydrogen sulfide. I'm oh, sorry. Just um, some practical questions. How do you get it in the water? And it just dissolves. Sodium hydrosulfide dissolves easily. Okay. And um, uh, you you know you cover it from light degradation and things like that. But other than that. Uh, and it's stable? In it is stable in water. Can you, can you put it in diet? It can be in a solid. It, this is in drinking water, so it goes through that. Yeah. People have administered intraperitoneally sodium sulfide or sodium hydrosulfide. It's one of our interventions. I thought so, yeah. Yeah. 
In the diet, yes. In fact, if time permits, I'll get to that. There's a great paper by Solomon Snyder, none other than Solomon. He, he referred to that paper in the talk um, in Nature, uh, which showed that administration of cysteine-rich diet resulted in correction of Huntington disease through hydrogen sulfide. So, so the scenario here is diabetes inhibits the production of hydrogen sulfide, inhibits AMPK, stimulates mTOR complex 1, stimulates mRNA translation, and results in matrix accumulation and albuminuria. And by supplying hydrogen sulfide, we can inhibit these injurious pathways. So clearly, hydrogen sulfide is not a marketable product when it comes to humans. So is there something else? So. Yes, I think the, in my country, some people drink the, the water from the hot spring yeah. near the volcano, and they has the, the sulfide the the part of the yeah the thing. You and know the they water. They believe that that's good for their health. But then it had also contains so many other things, minerals and things. So I would not know how to isolate that. In fact, uh, the, uh, one of the hypothesis about origin of life is that they occurred, life started around volcanic, uh, you know, eruptions with the sites and, uh, yeah, but, you know, obviously bacteria do very well because if you go to Yellowstone National Park, you can see bubbling hydrogen sulfide all over and there are plenty of bacteria there. All right, so we came across uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors as potential source for hydrogen sulfide and I'll say why that might be so. So these are, we know that there are three gases, perhaps even more, of course, oxygen, carbon dioxide, methane, I have not included here. Nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen sulfide are all bi physiologically active. NO activates soluble gonadyl, gonadyl cyclase, which promotes the generation of cyclic GNP. And inhibitors of PDE5 prolong the action or half-life of cyclic GNP and stimulate protein kinase G which then carries out a number of uh, uh, vascular smooth muscle relaxation, vasodilatation, drop in blood pressure, those kinds of things. What's been known is that hydrogen sulfide ameliorates ischemic heart injury. This is not new stuff. This has been around for at least eight years now. And there are a number of papers that, are, that have come and still continue to come on the importance of hydrogen sulfide in protecting or reversing ischemia-induced injury in the heart, both functionally as well as anatomically. PDE5 inhibitors, such as verdanafil, sildenafil, this is also an old, old news. Uh, I have given some of the references here, that they can also ameliorate ischemic heart injury. And one important paper showed, Salum showed in 2009, that this was H2S dependent. So there was a connection between nitric oxide pathway one gas and hydrogen sulfide, the other gas. So, so our question was, can we use PDE5 inhibitors to decrease high glucose induced kidney cell injury and does it work through hydrogen sulfide? So this came out this year. Again, Hakju did all this work. So very quickly, high glucose induced protein synthesis as well as hypertrophy could be reversed by tadalafil. And tadalafil also reversed high glucose induced laminin and fibronectin, which are important matrix proteins in the kidney, increment induced by high glucose. So again, signaling pathway showed that high glucose stimulated mTOR complex 1, and tadalafil promptly inhibited it. And high glucose, uh, then we asked, of course, is it working through, is tadalafil working through AMPK? Here is the AMPK. Tadalafil is a longer acting um, uh, PDE5 inhibitor. That's why we chose that, so that it's not very short acting. It, it, it peaks in uh, eight hours or so, and AMPK peaked around that time. And it also. Kashi, all, all that is in vitro, right? This is all in vitro. And P AMPK uh, phosphorylation reduced by high glucose was restored to normal by Tadalafil. And again, mTOR complex 1 inhibition by tadalafil that's induced by high glucose was AMPK dependent because compound C abrogated that inhibition. And of course, laminin uh, reduction 
induced by the lambda increment induced by high glucose that reduced by tadalafil also required AMPK action connecting all these things. So we then asked is tadalafil doing anything in terms of hydrogen sulfide? Tadalafil stimulated hydrogen sulfide generation and this could be inhibited by one of the selective inhibitors of CSC called propargyl glycine. This is a chemical inhibitor. It inhibited it. So suggesting tadalafil is probably stimulating hydrogen sulfide generation through CSC activation. And so we looked at CSC. CSC expression, protein expression could be seen as early as 30 minutes and certainly by one hour. So this was extremely rapid induction of CSE expression under tadalafil. mRNA was completely unchanged. So this suggested a post-transcriptional stimulation of CSE expression, and we did some classic biochemical experiments. So in other words, the tadalafil-induced CSE expression could be inhibited by cyclohexamide, but not actinomycin D. So we could eliminate, since actinomycin D is a transcription inhibitor, mRNA is unchanged, actinomycin D is not abrogating it, so this is a non-transcriptional mechanism. We further checked cyclohexamide, suggesting a translational inhibition by polysomal assay. Polysome assay is a very powerful way and direct way of testing whether a messenger RNA that's regulated by initiation for phase of mRNA translation, uh, you ca can you demonstrate it? Polysome is formed when a, a, a single mRNA transcript is bound by multiple ATS ribosomal units. So each, so that becomes the uh, trellis from which peptides are quickly synthesized. And since polysome is very heavy in, uh, in terms of centrifugation units, you can isolate polysomes through a 15 to 40 percent sucrose gradient, and the highest gradient will have the active polysomes. And then you see what the mRNA content is. Here is a control treated versus uh, um, tadalafil treated fourfold increment in isolation uh, uh, in the polysomal fraction. Now, this requires that you, there be no change in mRNA. So then this, whatever ambient mRNA concentration is, is selectively distributed to uh, polysome, indicating this regulation by tadalafil of CSC is through enhancing the efficiency of mRNA translation. So then to further test, we used SICSC, so by reducing it by about 50 percent, uh, SIRNA against CSC, AMPK that is induced by uh, tadalafil could not be induced anymore in the absence of CSC. So mm -hmm. tadalafil requires CSC expression and activation in order to uh, promote AMPK phosphorylation. So, and also we asked what about downstream of uh, AMPK, the laminin gamma 1, again tadalafil um, requires CSC because the reduction in uh, high glucose induced laminin 1 could not occur when CSC was reduced by means of SICSC. So hydrogen sulfide mediates the actions of <coughs> tadalafil. So tadalafil acts on the nitric oxide pathway. This is very well known, of course. So how is the interaction occurring between nitric oxide and hydrogen sulfide was the next question. Now, we read somewhere that tadalafil actually can induce ENOS expression. So not only is it a phosphodiesterase E5 inhibitor promoting cyclic GMP retention, but it may also generate nitric oxide upstream by stimulating ENOS in pulmonary tissue, for example. That was the paper. So we asked, can L-name come in the way of tadalafil induction of CSC, which is the hydrogen sulfide generating enzyme? And sure enough, L-name completely abrogated it, indicating there is also involvement of nitric oxide and nitric oxide synthase activity in tadalafil action in stimulating uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, generation. Sure enough, this was confirmed, the importance of uh, tadalafil in NO generation by direct measurement of nitrite nitrate. It was stimulated, coinciding with increase in CSC expression. And we could also show that hydrogen sulfide generation by tadalafil could be inhibited by L-name. 
So, all this clearly showed that tadalafil has to increase nitric oxide in order to stimulate CSC and then hydrogen sulfide and then on stimulate AMPK, stimulate, inhibit mTOR complex when induced by high glucose and inhibit high glucose induced kidney injury. Then we asked which is the NOS? So, ENOS is faintly expressed in these cells, but there was no change in ENOS with tadalafil. NNOS is not at all expressed, and the brain showed positive uh, control as being uh, the antibody being uh, okay. To our surprise, it was actually INOS. So, tadalafil stimulated INOS rather rapidly within 30 minutes to an hour, and this was uh, statistically significant. And the mRNA also went up, preceding the increase in protein. And this showed that this was a transcriptional regulation. I'm not showing data here. This could be completely abrogated by actinomycin D, indicating it is indeed a transcriptional inhibition. And the importance of INOS stimulation for generation of CSC and stimulating MPK is shown by using SI INOS. If we use a SI INOS, we can completely abrogate tadalafil induced uh, CSE expression, AMPK phosphorylation. We used a chemical inhibitor that is selective for INOS. We could again show the same thing. So, this clearly shows that tadalafil acts in two places. It, of course, promotes cyclic GMP elevation. We, are, there was, we also have an assay clearly showing tadalafil stimulates cyclic GMP. It stimulates INOS, and then it stimulates CSE and H2S to stimulate AMPK, inhibit mTOR complex 1 and matrix protein synthesis. There are a couple of papers showing that verdanafil or tadalafil can inhibit in diabetic rats and diabetic mice injury to the kidney, but it's not well done. Uh, again, we would love to do that, but we need money to do these things. So it does, sorry. I think the INOS, depending on the level of the nitric oxide production, but the INOS could be the Nitric oxide by the INOS could be the potentially the, the harmful to the tissue as well, right? So and the other side could be the potentially the source of the those the, the, the nitric oxide potentially the, the the make the injury for the glomerulus. So let let let's uh, so tadalafil actually ameliorates kidney injury. This has been shown by um, others in animal models, right? So all we are showing in in vitro that tadalafil protects against high glucose induced injury has to some extent there is uh, evidence that tadalafil and uh, verdanafil protect the kidney in diabetic mice. Of course, they have not looked at INOS. The role of INOS is extremely complicated. When you go through the uh, uh, literature, for example, the ischemic preconditioning that you can do to protect the uh, actual ischemia reperfusionary downstream is dependent on INOS. So, the protective effect of ischemic preconditioning on subsequent protection against actual ischemia reperfusion is INOS dependent. INOS where in cardiac tissue, INOS is important to be responding to adrenergic, adrenergic stimuli in cardiogenic shock by the myocyte whereas INOS in the infiltrating leukocytes is harmful to the myocyte. So, the site is important, the uh, cell is important, and the context is important. So, um, INOS, like most other biological molecules, is not uniformly evil and is not uniformly good. It has to be context dependent. I, mean, I don't know if you have the data or not. Based on the, your data, do you think that it's not there? I'm talking about the vasodilation. So, probably that could be the potentially the beneficial effect, right? What we know about NOS and diabetic kidney injury is if you induce diabetes in ENOS knockout mice, the injury is much worse. There is one paper from 2002. In INOS knockout mice, induction of diabetes resulted in worse kidney injury, suggesting INOS protects the kidney. So, this would agree with that. Yes. Um, in these cell cultures with a high glucose, 
it's my understanding from talking to Peter that many cell cultures have a high level of insulin in them. Does this, does this culture so, depend on insulin? No, we don't add insulin in these. Uh, what we do is we grow them in the presence of insulin, but all experimental conditions were pure high glucose. We did not add insulin in them. So, it, hydrogen sulfide inhibits reactive oxygen species production in mitochondria. This is well known. This is, this is way before us, and it augments GSS production. It increases NERF2, which is a pro transcription factor which promotes the expression of antioxidant genes. And NOX4 is a major source of ROS in the kidney in diabetic disease. This is work done by Dr. Abud and uh, Yves Goran in our lab, in, in our group. And NOX4 increases matrix synthesis in the kidney, and NOX4 inhibitors inhibit kidney injury, and there's a whole lot of evidence. Our question is, does hydrogen sulfide regulate NOX4 and therefore oxidant stress? So this, uh, this is unpublished. I'll just quickly go through some of the data. These are proximal tubular epithelial cells, which form about 85% of the cells making up the cortex of the kidney. So this is the major cell type. High glucose-induced NOX4 was abolished by sodium hydrosulfide. And that abolition was AMPK dependent. So it was also abolished by L name, indicating sodium hydrosulfide now requires NOS activation to protect, uh, uh, to reduce the NOx4 activation. We again looked at sodium hydrosulfide, whether it stimulates ENOS or NOS. There was no change in ENOS phosphorylation, ENOS amount. NOS is not expressed in these cells of the kidney. And again, sodium hydrosulfide promoted the expression of INOS. And if we use SI-INOS, sodium hydrosulfide induced reduction in high glucose induced laminin could be completely abrogated, indicating that, again, sodium hydrosulfide now in turn stimulates NOS production, NOS expression, INOS, and increases nitric oxide. And that is required for it to act as an inhibitory agent on laminin accumulation. And the, to prove the point, we use NONO8, which is a direct donor of nitric oxide. High glucose-induced NOx4 could be completely abrogated by NONO8. So to again further uh, examine this issue, we have CSE knockout mice that we obtained from. This, these are the mice that uh, was reported in science with hypertension, same mice. So these mice were given by Dr. Rui Wong very kindly. And NOx4, in these are unmanipulated mice. Just as they are in the cage, sacrifice them. CSE knockout mice have more NOx4 expression, reduction in INOS expression, and they have more albuminuria. They have more oxidative stress and lipotoxic stress. And interestingly, when sodium hydrosulfide was given to those diabetic mice, and control mice that we talked about, INOS was induced by sodium hydrosulfide in the kidney cortex. So uh, basically what we come to is that hydrogen sulfide deficiency contributes to kidney injury in diabetes. We have in vitro, in vivo evidence. Hydrogen sulfide ameliorates high glucose induced kidney injury by stimulating nitric oxide. Tadalafil decreases high glucose induced kidney cell injury by recruiting hydrogen sulfide through nitric oxide. So these two gases are highly integrated in the kidney, talking to each other, one upstream of the other, depending on the agent that's being used. And they collaborate in order to, in this situation, protect against diabetes-induced kidney injury. So this was all early stage. Now I'm going to pick up a little bit pace. So is not Good. yet. Oh, okay. Not yet. Someday we want to. Um, Hemoxygenase 1. Uh, uh, carbon monoxide clearly uh, has some of the similar properties similar to nitric oxide and um, uh, hydrogen sulfide. So two quick studies. Effect of rapamycin now in aging mice. We only showed early on when very young mice. Does it remain a effective agent in aging mice? And again, rapamycin, with all the excitement about the lifespan extension, what does it do to diabetic mice, which is diabetes is such a prevalent condition in society? So 
Kavitha did this uh, study basically seven months. We don't, we didn't know how long DBDB mice lived. These are type 2 diabetic mice. We chose type 2 because 95% of diabetes in the community is type 2. So we chose on an arbitrary fashion. There was references to the lifespan like this, like diabetic, DBDB mice may not live one year. So that's how they had left. So, but we had no idea. So we chose seven months and gave rapamycin diet for four months, the same as Dr. Andy Strong's. I mean, of course, this is all from the group. And this way, we, you can find that there is no change at the age of 11 months when they were sacrificed. There was no change in blood glucose. In female, there was a little bit of rise in blood glucose due to rapamycin. Kidney, I'll go very quickly, was sclerotic at the age of 11 months. There was no change with rapamycin. We could do, uh, Dr. Bonds did, um, uh, computerized uh, morphometry. There was no change in collagen 1 alpha 2 fibronectin, which was increased in diabetic mice, no change in rapamycin. There was increase in type 4 collagen due to diabetes, no change with rapamycin. These are n equals 10 mice in each group. There was no evidence of mTOR complex 1 activation as assessed by 40 BP1 in diabetic mice on controlled diet. There was no significant reduction with rapamycin. 40 BP1, there was no increase in phosphorylation. So we did not find evidence of P76 kinase. None of the parameters for mTOR complex 1 activation uh, was seen in vehicle treated diabetic mice, and there was no change with rapamycin. Rapamycin was, this is done by Dr. Javers uh, in his HPLC. Uh, blood rapamycin levels were comparable in uh, uh, these mice and in the kidney cortex as well. In fact, there was relative concentration of rapamycin compared to blood in the kidney cortex. And only thing we found in male mice, the serine 473 phosphorylation was decreased by rapamycin, suggesting mTOR complex 2 may be inhibited by prolonged administration of rapamycin. When you say male mice, did you also look at females? Yeah, yeah. See, this is all female, this is all male. And we didn't see this at all in the female. Huh. So, um, so everything was male and female. So we looked at urine albumin, albumin losses, like protein urine. Cash, so yeah. how do you interpret the <clears throat> lack of suppression of S6 kinase phosphorylation you know, we, I mean, I have talked to everyone in this uh, audience. Um, it is so hard to find always every tissue showing the uh, evidence for phosphorylation changes. I mean, this is what, uh, I, you know, Randy has told me, Dave have, has told me. It's re You're lucky if you can find it. I mean, you know, then you have, but it's not always the case. Let's see, one of the things I suspect is, uh, we, we, we took away rapamycin for 16 hours uh, before we um, sacrificed the mice. Number two, phosphorylation reactions are notoriously transient. You are lucky if at the time of sacrifice, you have all the mice cycling in that tissue exactly the same way that to show mTOR complex 1 activation and its inhibition with rapamycin. And it may depend on the tissue the amount of rapamycin that actually is low inhibit yes yes yeah no no in fact uh, that that uh, concentration i showed was relatively low compared to other concentrations but then they were not eating the food for 16 hours but then they tell me that they don't really eat always during the night so i don't know the answer clearly to that yeah that was what i was trying to get at uh, perhaps dr javers Maybe he did it already, or, or I don't know where those data, concentration data were, in the plasma or in the kidney tissue? Both. So there, the rapamycin is there? Absolutely. In oh, the, yeah. In the Clearly, tissue. yeah. See, this is the point I was making. See, look at the blood nanogram per mil. Oh, it's renal. This is blood. This is renal cortical. And this is, you know, it is, in fact, relatively concentrated in the kidney cortex. Assuming one gram of uh, kidney cortex corresponds to one mil uh, in volume. Yeah. Good yeah. Uh, you answered it partially, but these animals were sacrificed after 16 hours. Fasting. Uh, uh, but most of the activation experiments in feeding them. 
you know, we have. Let me tell you, my I I am glad you're raising this issue. This I have, you know, we have discussed in the aging group for last three years. This data when we came out, it was a problem for us. See, on the one hand, mTOR complex one activation is sensitive to nutrient intake. We know that through amino acid intake, through RAGs, and so on. Uh, you know, the um, uh, the communication, the cue to mTOR complex one activation is nutrient signaling. So one can argue, well, you took off for 16 hours, chances are the nutrient cues were not there. But they have high blood glucose. These mice had in hundreds till the end. So you saw that, right? I mean, you know, four to five hundred. So in diabetes, if the driving force for mTOR complex one activation is blood glucose, that condition was adequately fulfilled here. And yet we did not see. Because it's not like your normal non-diabetic mouse getting food and therefore mTOR complex one being stimulated. Here is a pathological increment in blood glucose which should be driving mTOR complex one for its pathological ends. It did not occur. So um, then we looked at urinary albumin uh, because see, clinically as you well know, Proteinuria is a very sensitive and commonly employed marker of kidney disease. This is what we do in the clinic. So you look at this, you see the, in the baseline before the start of the study, the um, um, albuminuria is fully six-fold higher in diabetic mice compared to the non-diabetic mice in both males and females. So there's no question about establishment of kidney injury in these mice. And then at 11 months, following four months of rapamycin, there is no change in albuminuria. There was no reduction in albuminuria as we saw early on. And in fact, in the non-diabetic male mice and to some extent in the female mice, there was actually a significant increase due to rapamycin. This we know from our patients with kidney transplants and so on where we use rapamycin a lot, that rapamycin can provoke albuminuria and proteinuria in transplant patients. It can cause podocyte damage, it can cause proximal epithelial damage, and result in exaggerated protein losses in the urine indicating kidney injury. So this is consistent with that. So we did not see a benefit. Actually, the non-diabetic mice got shunted because of increased proteinuria. And there was no change in creatinine clearance. Uh, we measured by uh, uh, urinary collection. By rapam there was no change in vehicle treated diabetic mice and compared to non diabetic mice, and certainly RAPA did not do anything. And then we looked at the survival. Rapamycin prolonged survival in many mice strains, effect on diabetic mice was not known. So, natural survival of DBDB mice was not known. So, type 2 diabetic male and female mice control a RAPA diet at the age of 4 months, 40 mice in each group followed till natural death and necropsy was performed. 50% mortality on controlled diet in males was 349 days and 487 in female diabetic mice. So female diabetic mice do better than male diabetic mice. 84% of the genetic complement of DVDB mice is C57 BL6, 16% DBA2. So compared to BL6 mice, this is almost 50% reduction in just vehicle treated, you know, regular diabetic mice. On rapamycin, there was a reduction in lifespan uh, in uh, male mice and in female mice by about 15%. And this was significant uh, by statistical analysis by Alex Bokov. So here is the survival curve. So we saw that rapamycin actually shortens lifespan in diabetic mice. The question is, why? So Dr. Eno and Dr. Albert did nearly 160 mice necropsy studies. So diabetic mice natural cause of death was actually suppuration, just on controlled diet. These mice, generally if you, BL6 mice die of lymphoreticular malignancies, but actually these mice died of suppuration. And the separation was increased by rapamycin in both male and female. Didn't quite reach statistical significance, but the trend was there. Here is 
normal kidney and suppuration, intense lymphocyte infiltration. And we could not find out what the bacteria, what any particular kind of uh, invasive organism because these were done after they would naturally die. Then uh, diabetic mice developed less neoplasms than expected. And what was interesting to us is the kind of neoplasm. Actually, they died more of hepatocellular carcinoma than lymphoreticular hepatocellular carcinoma, than liver cancer, than lymphoreticular malignancy. So not only was there less malignancy, but then the phenotype of the malignancy was also changed from lymphoreticular to um, liver cancer. So you know, go ahead, Nick. That's pretty interesting. What would it be possible that? those malignancies are more common in old mice and these didn't become that old as, for example, like... So, so this is how we wrote, it. This, this just came out this paper uh, this month. The discussion, what we said was, we don't know if these mice had lived long enough, what they would develop, right? Are they dying of premature senescence or are they dying of complications of diabetes? Is, a, is an important issue, right? So yeah, right. Um, where were the where were these animals housed? They were all in uh, Basha, <laughs> in the pristine uh, Hilton of Basha. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, you know, we, they were. I'm glad that was so. Let me tell you because yeah. I'm extremely grateful. There was no question of uh, it being any other housing that could be superior than that. So, so is it, so, so it, were there any infections that you, that you were you, you know it's in, that Randy you, see I, this these died at 14 to 15 months right by 11 months when we selectively in the study one sacrificed them we didn't find infections looks like something happens between 11 after 11 months where they become you know the um, uh, the mice may lose weight they they are probably tremendously catabolic and something about their susceptibility to infection goes up at that time. Well, I think we didn't take, we didn't take with the, the oh, sorry. <laughs> we didn't take with the immune function of these guys, right? Yeah, we did and, not. And uh, I think the best, uh, if I remember correctly, some diabetic patients are the more respond to, to the, some the infections. Oh, yeah, the that's for sure. Right? Especially urinary tract right, infection. Exactly. Yeah. That's what we saw. The, many of them, the inflammation is in the urinary tract. Right, kidney. Goes up to the kidney. Look at and this. Also, I mean, this is a very telling. Yeah, <laughs> and also the, we saw that some of the, the infectious, no, no, the, the inflammatory infection is also in the subcutaneous. I see. The area. Yeah. So that the, any kind of the potential of the, the infectious opportunity mm -hmm. is catching them. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I think that something has to do with the the the, the di diabetic no, the diabetic the status. Diabetic yeah. And also the potentially the maybe they're doing something bad then for the suppressing their the immune function. Yeah. I think that's the potential. Only in diabetic mice because Tyler Curiel's right. work shows right. that it's right. not so right. in the normal right. aging mice, right? Yeah. So can you have suppuration without having an infection? Can you have separation without infection? Oh, I would say the urinary disease is something that has to do with infection. And the, especially in this case, because the, we saw that the, we saw that the, no, the, 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 the inflammatory region in the, the urinary bladder and also the going up to the, the, the kidney. That's a definitely the, the some kind of infection. Yeah. Mainly the, may not be the, the microorganism, pathological microorganism. Maybe something has to be the regular the, the, the microorganism needs don't have the, the pathogenesis to the healthy other. But they may be the some kind of opportunistic infection type of organism. Like become invasive in the exactly. setting of diabetes. Right. Yeah. So, so, so just one more related yes. question. Is this a cause of death that occurs in diabetic human patients? So in diabetic human patients, the number one cause of death, especially with kidney disease, is coronary artery disease. 
So, but, but do you ever get something that resembles this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what, what, in what, fact, what, yeah. What, what is it in humans that So, for example, this? you can get infection of the urine, bladder cystitis can spread to kidney, pyelonephritis, enter the circulation, septic shock, and then death. And this is much more frequent in diabetes. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's, I'm it's, sure it is. I mean, it is more frequent. Yeah. Uh, that typically, they don't die because they go to the hospital yeah. with a kidney infection, but... Yeah, it's certainly more, those infections are more frequent in diabetics. Yes. What's, um, how similar is the pathology, if at all, of the OBOB mouse to the DBDB mouse? So the reason we, now, I, I want to put some caveats on this. And in the next slide, I'll show you where my reservations are. OBOB mice do not consistently develop kidney lesions. That's why we don't no, use, what? do not consistently develop kidney lesions of diabetic nephropathy. The reason we study DBDB mice is because they have some semblance to human kidney disease. Not all. For example, you saw even at the age of 11 months there was no reduction in clearance function. That's a ding against this model actually. But nobody had looked at DBDB mice of that length of uh, life. Um, but they do develop proteinuria, they do develop uh, the uh, increase in uh, matrix deposition. So we don't have a, a model of animal, like a mouse model or a rat model, that consistently develops all the features of diabetic nephropathy, including reduction in uh, GFR, reduction in clearance function, matrix, and massive protein. Yes, sir. But I, I, I would just want to follow that. Do the OBOB mice yeah. develop diabetes? Yeah, they do. Because they have leptin, they're leptin deficient, Whereas these are leptin receptor mutants. The reason I wanted to ask that had to do with the fact that David Harrison many years ago looked at <clears throat> the effect of food restriction on lifespan in the OBOB mouse. And the, this was in the black six background. Yes. The OBOB mouse also had a very shortened lifespan. I see. Similar to what you're showing. But food restriction pushed. Oh, wow pushed it back up to the extended lifespan that you saw in wild type wow. black six. So it was a huge effect. Yes. And when did he start the diet restriction? What age? Early. Early. I don't remember exactly, but early. That's fascinating. Dr. Clark. Um, sir, I have two questions about this finding here. Maybe you said this, but was this limited to kidney or did no. you find it? In no, 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 no. It was tissue? Liver, I mean, you know, Dr. Ikeno is right there. Okay. Yes, I mean, multiple organs, multiple yeah. organs. Yeah. Kidney was prominent, but multiple yeah. organs. And then second, um, what's the makeup of the inflammatory cells there? What, what, what are the, uh, what, what are they, are they le leukocytes? Yeah, maybe leukocytes. Well, leukocytes what? I mean, Poly PMNs. lymphocytes? Huh? Neutrophils? Neutrophils. Neutrophils. Okay. Neutrophils. Okay. Neutrophils. Mainly. Any, any monocyte, macrophage types? Yes, some they mixture, but the main they they so yeah. mostly very acute response. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <coughs> I guess that suggests it might it was the cause of death. Perhaps it, it was going on for a lengthy period, maybe. Um, right. So our summary on this: in early stage, rapamycin ameliorates kidney injury and diabetes. Established, it did not ameliorate, but worsen mortality. It is possible biology of renal disease changes between early and late stages. And we need to better understand the interaction between aging and diabetes. Now, is this premature aging or is this a premature death because of other events? We still have to. But there is evidence from other papers that diabetic mice do manifest features of aging. Uh, interventional approaches should be long term. And we need to study RAPA in other models of diabetes. These are leptin receptor mutants. Who knows what leptin has to do with this? So we really need other studies. And so I'll now quickly wrap up this uh, and so talk about aging kidney because this is really dear to us. So basically aging kidney undergoes nephrosclerosis. Glomerosclerosis, atrophy of the tubules and in interstitial fibrosis in the tubular <coughs> interstitium and arterial sclerosis. And these changes can lead to ischemia because the blood supply is getting narrowed. Then. Reduction in number of nephrons occurs, Nef the remaining nephrons hypertrophy and then reduced clearance I am showing you the Baltimore longitudinal study here, the data of creatinine clearances. Creatinine clearances themselves have problems. But anyway, this is the data we have. 
is almost the only paper in terms of serial longitudinal measurement of clearance function of the kidney over years and years as shown here. One group shows reduction, another subset shows smaller reduction, a third of them do not show reduction at all. So, it is extremely heterogeneous what happens to kidney like in other organs in the age. And there is so, in, a, in average it does not change? Hmm? In average won't in, in 30 percent it did not, the GFR measured by creatinine clearance. In average person of aging, 70 percent it did. The what happens is serum creatinine does not change in human beings in blood test, but their muscle production of creatinine also goes down. But that is when you do the histology 30, 40 percent losses occur over time as aging occurs. And there is a risk for higher kidney disease, higher risk for kidney disease in acute and tonic setting as well as drug retention and toxicity with aging. And end stage kidney disease, the elderly are particularly susceptible, highest susceptibility for developing kidney injury needing dialysis and minorities are at higher risk. We reported a few years ago the C6, BL6 mice with aging, uh, uh, what happens to them. We took three groups, young, middle aged and old and showed that there was a progressive increment in glomerular matrix expansion, tubulo interstitial matrix expansion, increase in albuminuria. Cystatin C accumulation correlates with reduction in the clearance function. There was a progressive middle to young to middle to old. TGF beta activation, SMAD3 activation, and we did some other microRNA work and reported that there was kidney hypertrophy matrix expansion of the urea through TGF beta pathway. But all this requires protein synthesis, and so we looked at signaling. So, we said there are three possibilities kinases that promote protein synthesis may be activated or there could be reduction in phosphatases which oppose the action of kinases P10 is a classic inhibitor of PIT kinase signaling, but then we did not find any change in P10 in that paper that we reported in that paper that I just showed you. So, then we kinases that constitutionally inhibit protein synthesis case in point is AMPK and taking a leaf from diabetes and mTOR activation, we asked and we the survey uh, we did a survey on hydrogen sulfide because of its endogenous ability to suppress mTOR complex 1 and stimulate AMPK. So, we surveyed the tissues of hydrogen sulfide status uh, in these mice. Of all the tissues that we studied, we could find parallel changes selectively in the kidney and the brain and that is all I am going to present. So, basically H2S synthesis was reduced in both kidney and the brain and uh, um, H2S content not only rate of synthesis, but content was also decreased in uh, these are BL6 mice 6 to 8. I am only taking young and old of the mice that we had reported that we showed uh, just now the changes of CSC expression CVS expression was less in the kidney both enzymes responsible for hydrogen sulfide synthesis and the mRNA was also reduced indicating this is a transcriptional regulation. None of this has been reported so far, this is all unpublished. In the brain also CSC and CBS expression is reduced and whereas the CSC mRNA is actually increased even though protein is decreased and there was no significant change in CBS mRNA. So, what this tells us is that there could be post transcriptional regulation of these enzymes not transcriptional reduction to account for the reduction in the protein. We looked at AMPK activation, activity activation is reduced in the kidney and in the brain and P6, P76 kinase mTOR complex 1 activity is increased in the kidney, increased in the brain and by B4E BP1 as well there was a tendency there was clearly increment in uh, kidney tendency to increase indicating mTOR complex 1 is active in these older can, mice. Can you go back uh, please? Okay. So, so the suggestion here is that the reduction in NPK is probably releasing the break on mTOR complex 1 and mTOR complex 1 is active. We looked at AKT phosphorylation, uh, the marker of PDK1, 
strain in 308 was increased, tendency to increase in the brain, and serine 473, which is a mTOR complex 2 site, was increased in the kidney and the brain. Yeah. How do you define a young and old? Oh, so these are about 26 to 28 months old. These are about 5 to 6 months old. And they are the same mice that we showed uh, those histological changes, functional changes. And then we looked at insulin receptor activation. In a separate story we have not brought in today, we are highly interested in role of insulin receptor as an injurious agent in the kidney, in uh, type 2 diabetes, in uh, high fat diet fed mice and so on. So we looked at this. This is well known, of course, how insulin receptor has been implicated in aging. So we wanted to see if we can find anything. By immunoplotting, we found, you know, some kind of a suggestion that there was insulin receptor activation. But we used an ELISA to confirm actually in both the kidney and the brain, there is increase in insulin receptor activation. And we have some data, which I'm not showing today. It's too preliminary, that insulin can actually govern reduction in CBS and CSE expression in kidney cells. One nanomolar insulin. We use extremely low concentrations that are seen in insulin resistant states. So signaling kinases could be targets to slow down kidney injury in aging. So the point we are making is aging can result in hydrogen sulfide deficiency, which may reduce AMPK, release its break on mTOR complex 1, and stimulate protein synthesis. And there are a number of uh, agents that we have reported in the past to intervene at specific areas either through PDE5 tadalafil, inhibitor tadalafil or metformin, adiponectin, resveratrol, rapamycin to perhaps test this pathway as potential sites for intervention. H2S mediates salutary effects of dietary restriction in aging. This is a paper that came out as you all know uh, just this year. And so H2S reinforcing naturally occurring inhibitory kinase through AMPK, perhaps through H2S, could be a strategy. And the effect of H2S on kidney and brain function, health span and lifespan need to be studied. And we have just gotten a small pilot grant from Nathan Shark, and we're very grateful. We will be testing this possibility in the near future. That's it. Great work. Thank you. Nice. Yes. I was noticing in some of your, where you showed the individual data on like world I was noticing there is a certain amount of variability. Yes, absolutely. Animal, and I'm wondering if you've done enough animals, particularly in the whole group, to look for sort of correlations among the various parameters and see if so, certain individual animals would stand out as being more resistant to the change of aging? Yeah. In fact, this we did when we wrote that paper in 2012, in that aging cell paper, because we noticed the heterogeneity of uh, cystatin C data, which is a marker for glomerulfiltration rate. And we even brought that point up in the paper in discussion, showing, look, this is a heterogeneity here. Similar to what the Baltimore longitudinal study had shown, that 30% of aging individuals did not lose um, uh, renal function. So also in this uh, group, in the cystatin C, we gave individual, uh, you know, what do you call a scatter diagram showing that some may not show that kind of a reduction in GFR after all. And that's the heterogeneity. Look at this. Uh, this is, for example, in the old mice. We had serum cystatin go from 300 to 600. Look at the spread. And these two are no different than the young mice. So whereas, and these are six mice. So you could have one third by coincidence. <coughs> one third of the mice, not showing reduction in GFR. So yes, aging is a highly heterogeneous uh, how, process. How about comparisons among different strains of mice? Ah, yes. <laughs> well, were you going to answer that? The, for, the aging related albuminuria is highly strain dependent. There is a paper in Kidney International, uh, Jim uh, alerted me to, and clearly shows strain dependent changes. Dietary restriction response is highly strain dependent. 
rapamycin response could be strain dependent. In some strains, you may not find uh, a increase in lifespan. Yep, genetic heterogeneity is a very important uh, factor. <coughs> yes? I think that, uh, you know that I, my knowledge about diabetes is very, very limited. But I think that one of the pathogenesis of the, the diabetes is uh, the non glycated uh, oh, the uh, advanced glycation end products. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, what do you think that the, the potentially the, the glycation end product is fair low? Oh, yeah. Them? Yeah, in fact, age products may occur in the absence of diabetes. So, that can definitely be a, a play a role because other groups like Helen Lasara from Mount Sinai and all this, they have been studying age products for so long that we have not gone into it. Yes, absolutely. This is just one aspect that we are studying of a very multi-dimensional process. Actually, there's a lot of uh, data there, and I apologize um, if I'm asking a question that Please. may be put up there and I missed. But um, hydrogen sulfides known to inhibit complex four in the mitochondria. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering how much uh, of this is mitochondrial. Yeah, and, and in fact, you know, there are many retrograde responses that kick out of the mitochondria that activate AM kinase, for example. Yeah. Um, oh, could well be. And I'm wondering if, if, if there's an indirect, if, if one, if you know how hydrogen sulfide activates uh, AMP kinase, and two, <coughs> whether it's indirect via the mitochondria. In our uh, 2012 JVC paper, we worked out there are three potential upstream kinases for AMPK. LKB1, calcium kinase, kinase beta, and to some extent PKC as well. But we use the first two because they, they are more commonly associated with NPK phosphorylation on threonine 172 of the alpha catalytic subunit. What we found was L, we used siRNA against these specific two enzymes. It is CAM kinase, kinase beta in the setting of hydrogen sulfide that is stimulated and its calcium dependence and, and all that we showed. So that scan kinase kinase beta which is involved in AMPK phosphorylation. So then that, actually that enzyme is, is a, a known retrograde response enzyme activation of that via the calcium response changes in calcium. Perhaps, yeah. Uh, because it's a calcium colmodulin driven enzyme, yeah. so it has to depend on a, an internal rise in cellular calcium, perhaps from endoplasmic reticulum release of... Uh, oh, uh, yes, I remember, uh, uh, what's his name there? Um, Abbott Harney is his surname, I can't remember his first name, sorry. Uh, uh, he mapped out a, uh, uh, that, that exact pathway. It's calcium, uh, the mitochondria don't take the calcium up, so the levels build up. I see. Yeah. I see. No, we have not touched mitochondria here at all. Uh, I'm sure uh, there are mitochondrial yeah. contributions here that we do not. Yes? Can we propose a system in the entire system? Well, you know, that needs to be tested. I mean, every, this is all hypothetical. This is all, you know, facts here and there. Cause and effect has to be proven very carefully. Yes. And one of the questions we have is, do CSC knockout mice have a reduced lifespan? If this is true, <laughs> then do they live long? You know, how long do they live? We do not know the lifespan. Of. We do have the mice. Again, all these are very expensive studies and we are hamstrung by lack of funding. Thank you so much. Appreciate your attention.